it is a PhD project that CCLG funded um, of a young man called James. He's at the line there. Um, and why is that? Why? Okay. And, and he's sitting there and he's um, working hard on this. But it obviously fits in with other things we do. And um, so leukemia is simple, a disease of genetic changes. So when that happens, then there's one genetic event, but it's probably very early in life, probably before birth. And then there's a second genetic event, and these kind of follow on to each other. And there are subsequent genetic and epigenetic changes that drives the leukemia. And that is a transcriptional program. That's what you call it. Certain genes are switched off, certain are on, and that is all nasty and gives a proliferative advantage and failure to differentiate. And I write it here for leukemia, but it's probably not so dissimilar for any other cancer. Something happens once, another thing, thing happens, and then you have got something that, um, that grows uncontrollable. And, <coughs> and that, um, these, these, these transcriptional programs, they not only um, let the cells grow and fail to differentiate, they also determine how a tumor responds to chemotherapy. And one of the um, little things that can be, um, can be driving this process is the activation of a gene called EVI1. It's called ecotropic viral integration site because that's how it was discovered. There was a gene, a, a virus put in, but it's now known to be a slightly more complicated little candidate. But that's what we work on because we know that can drive a very nasty way of leukemia. And to illustrate that, I've got um, here um, on this, this looks very complicated, but it's not actually. So here, you have all these genetic changes listed, yeah, that can happen in leukemia. And here, you have the pattern of gene expression, yeah? So that if it's red, it's up. If it's green, it's down. So, and you can see that they are kind of cluster. Now, there's a group here, and they respond to this genetic change. And there's a group here that responds to or corresponds to this genetic change, and that is EVI1. And when you then look how these um, patients do, these are um, children and adults, and then you see that these ones who overexpress everyone are the ones who do particularly bad. Yeah, so these are the ones that we want to really tackle. And there's something that is discriminating them from others. So that might be the Achilles heel of this leukemia. And I wonder whether it's also for other tumors, because um, we came there um, a couple of years ago when there was a Manchester patient who had a leukemia that overexpressed this protein to an amount that we never saw any other cell life. So much of the stuff, and he unfortunately didn't do well, but we were able to really look at this protein in much more detail than anybody else was able to do that before. So we did mass spectrometry with that. Um, that is basically looking at protein in very, very tiny amounts, and you can look how they are modulated, because proteins are not just proteins. They constantly get changed in a cell, and that's how the cell drives its purpose. And in cancer cells, that's obviously not a very good purpose. But we found phosphorylation and all kinds of stuff in these proteins, and we found lots of protein that interact with this protein. And one of them here is really important for this interaction of this leukemia driver. And um, we now know that Mice without this gene are not viable, but too much gives you um, a very bad leukemia. And it's very important for the lineage commitment in early hematopoiesis. And um, just over the last couple of years, there are several cases shown where they don't have, a, where they have an inherited disruption, they have bone marrow failure, and also leukemia. But in AML, it's um, known to cause a very poor prognosis leukemia, and it's commonly um, resulting from inversions and translocations, but also it can be driven by another genetic event. For example, in the infant leukemias with an MLL gene rearrangement. Is that, are we still there? <coughs> and, um, and there is possibly a role in other cancers which um, is not really explored. And it's, um, it's getting even more complicated because there are different isoforms of this protein. So there's a very long form, then there's a shorter form, and there's the normal form. And then this, this, this protein is phosphorylated. So it gets really, really kind of nitty gritty complicated. And because we can do, we found these two phosphorylation events. 
And um, so the, the question that James addresses all night long and all day long in his PhD, so what are the functions of these ISO forms? What are the functions of these phosphorylations? And can we fiddle with it, with a tablet or with something that stops this leukemia driver to work? So it, in the CIUK slide, it would be on the very left end, yeah? that we define something basic that might be a target. Yeah? So if we, if we put a spanner in the works there, we stop the process. That would be the thing that we are kind of after. Um, so what we did, um, we looked at these phosphorylation sites, and then we know that these phosphorylations, the way they are made in this protein, they are made by damage. Yeah? So if a cell gets damaged or gets stressed or is treated by chemotherapy, yeah, when that happens, then this kind of phosphorylation occurs. So this is a phosphorylation that will occur if somebody gets chemotherapy. So if there's a leukemia where this oncogene is the driver, this phosphorylation will happen when there's chemotherapy given. Yeah, so there's a, there's a link to the treatment response. And, um, and we, we looked at this with antibodies, and here you can see that when you irradiate uh, the cells, or you can use other, you can use chemo or radiation, or you can use H2O2, something that stresses the cells like chemotherapy, then you see an increase of this phosphorylation. So we wanted to know what that does. Um, so what happens is probably that this protein is phosphorylated once, and that happens normally, but when there's stress, when there's chemo, when there's something like this, then you see another phosphorylation. And we're talking in a massive cell with a tiny nucleus and a tiny bit of a phosphorus. So I, but I think that's where the key is of this, this very nasty oncoprotein. So here, here is, um, is where we looked at it. So what we did, we changed, we changed in a, in a artificial gene, a construct. We changed this bit, which is phosphorylated, and we made it non-phosphorylatable. Yeah? So we looked how this behaves you take this phosphorylation away. And then we did this um, with kidney cells because they are very easy to work with. And we put in the mutated form and the normal form. And when you just let them grow, you don't see any difference. If this is going down with this EV1 and this is going down with the EV1 mutant and this is going up with the EV1. But there's no difference under normal uh, conditions when you look at the genes that are modulated by but if you damage them, if you apply chemotherapy, then all of a sudden you see the difference. Yeah? And so these ones are not upregulated when the phosphorylation is there, and these ones are not downregulated when the phosphorylation is there. And when you put this oncogene into, into fibroblast cells of rats, then these rats obviously all of a sudden start forming colonies, which is basically what this does. It makes colonies growing, it, ma it makes growth that is uncontrollable. That is the feature of an oncogene. If, if you put that into, into the uh, fibroblasts of these rats, then they start to grow like a cancer. And if you do that with these mutants, where we kind of change that phosphorylation bit here, then you see no difference. So that does all the same, as long as you don't give chemotherapy. When you give chemotherapy, or any other kind of stress, then all of a sudden you see that the mutant form is not able to maintain this. So what we found out there is that this phosphorylation is maintaining the ability to, to drive a cancer in the presence of chemotherapy. And we've done it even more sophisticated. We take little mouse, or James took little mouse, um, and um, nobody was looking, but then he took out of their little femurs, the, the, hematur pro um, the, the progenitor cells, the immature blood cells, the cells that become leukemic. And we put in that gene, yeah, we just did what happens in the lab. What happens when leukemia develops, we just did exactly that in the laboratory with mouse um, hematopoietic progenitor cells, the pre-leukemic cells. And we found that they then start, that they make colonies. Yeah, they start to grow. And then you can harvest them again, and then you can, you can plate them again, and they regrow. But only if the phosphorylation site is phosphorylatable, not in the mutant. So we have identified something here, that it's important to maintain the driving force of that oncogene. And that is a simple, or it's not a simple, but it is a phosphorylation, 
at the carboxy terminal end. So um, that's what we have found. And then we thought, how does it do that? Why, what happens with that protein when it is not able to maintain its function? And I showed you that slide before with all the other proteins it interacts. And then we looked at its major interaction partner, that's called CDBP1. But anyway, we painted CDBP1 green and EGR1 red. And you can't really see it very good because the light is awful. But when you have it untreated, and you have it a little bit of orange, because that's <coughs> when they come together, it becomes orange. And if you treat them, the wild type, the not changed type, it gets really orange. They come together, because that's what this oncogene does. But if we, and, and that happens with radiation and with, um, with all kinds of stresses. And it does it also in cells who express it. This is the leukemia from that little boy who has so much of it. And it comes together when um, there's, where there's, there's stress and when there's chemotherapy. But it doesn't do that when, um, you, you, um, when you mutate this. So um, we can quantify that. And when there's damage, this essential um, interaction is stopped. So basically, this damaged chemotherapy-induced phosphorylation sustains the function of this oncogene. So we might have found an Achilles heel to, to do exactly this. So the question, and that's what James is after, is can we tackle that? Can we attack this with a simple um, medication? And what, is, what are the other Achilles heels of this oncogene? I think that's very interesting, and thank you very much for listening. <laughs>